This is Zach Yaku from How to Get a Job in Sports.com, and I'm here with Colin Cosell, PA announcer for the New York Mets, the New York Riptide, and founder of C2 Studios. How are you? I'm doing well, Zach. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you here. You know, let's talk about your time in college. You went to State University of New York. Tell me about your time there. Um, you know, it was kind of funny. I, I went into college. Um, uh, I spent my first two years at uh, SUNY New Paltz, um, which is kind of like mid to upstate uh, New York. Um, beautiful, beautiful campus, kind of tucked away in, uh, in some mountains. And um, I went there to major in communications, radio and TV broadcast. Um, and, uh, I did, I continued doing a lot of theater, which I'd been doing since I was uh, six years old. Um, it was an awesome experience, loved it there. Uh, and then I got an internship at Saturday Night Live and, um, deemed it, uh, more important, um, to be closer to the city because it was going to be a minimum of three days a week that I'd be going in there and it would become a nightmare. Um, so I transferred, uh, well, commute, commute wise would be a nightmare. So I transferred to SUNY Purchase. Um, where I was able to complete my studies. I became a commuter student, so we saved some money that way. Um, and at that point, you know, the, you're, you're a little detached from the, the college scene. Uh, I mean, I made some friends there, um, a couple of, you know, a couple that I'm still friends with today. Um, but, you know, it was a very different experience, and uh, uh, I think it was worth it. SNL was an absolute blast, and um, you know, by, by the time it was over, I, I went out into the world, and uh, tried my hand at everything except for sports broadcasting. So <laughs> until I was 30. That's great. So, you know, you did stand up comedy for a long time after that, you know, was the dream, you know, getting an internship at SNL, uh, you know, was it to be a stand up comedian? Was that, you know, your, your dream? I didn't really know. Um, I was kind of, uh, you know, multi, um, uh, multi interested, I, I guess. Um, Cause I love doing theater. Um, I knew I could make people laugh. You know, I used to have basically like little comedy shows in the back of the school bus when I was in elementary school. Um, and when I was on and everyone was, you know, dying laughing, I was just like, this, this is, this is amazing. I love this feeling. Um, but I also knew, um, having watched my grandfather and having been a sports fan that I was in love with the idea of being a sports broadcaster. Um, I was in love with uh, radio as a medium as well. And, uh, I got my first gig in radio uh, for a uh, station on Long Island here in New York uh, when I was 19 years old. And so um, I knew eventually I wanted to be in sports. Um, I kind of shied away from it um, after uh, my sophomore year, I believe, in, in college. I was in class and one of my professors was teaching me about my grandfather and it kind of freaked me out. Like I knew he was famous, but I didn't know he was like get taught in my class famous. Um, so, uh, so I kind of shied away from it and figured out, you know, there's many other avenues where I could fulfill my need to be in front of an audience or in front of a microphone. And, uh, and I followed those avenues all throughout my twenties. That's great. You know, I was about to say, you, you must've learned some of those, you know, public speaking skills from your grandfather. Your grandfather was the great Howard Cosell. He was one of the most famous, you know, American sports journalists, you know, of all time. Tell me a bit, you know, how he's inspired you. Um, I mean, it, it started at a young age. I, I really, he was such a doting grandfather. I didn't understand or know his celebrity um, until I was older because, you know, I'm five, six years old uh, walking around with my grandfather and people are, you know, shouting like, hey, Howie, or like, hey, it's Cosell. And I'm like, what do you, why are they doing this? Like, I don't, it just didn't make sense to me. That being said, um, he had a uh, he had house out, um, in the in the Hamptons on Long Island and in his bedroom he had a, a microphone set up with headphones uh, with a live line that went directly to ABC radio where he was I mean at that point he had earned the ability to be at his vacation house and uh, and record his uh, his little 60 second radio spot um, from the comfort of his own home and so you know I saw this microphone and I was kind of intrigued by it and I was, you know I asked him if I could watch him do his thing one day um, he did, and I sat on his lap. I talked into the microphone, put on the headphones, and, and did my first ever sound check. Uh, and and it played back to me, and I was just like, I, I don't know what you are, microphone, or what kind of witchcraft this is, but you and I are going to have a long-standing relationship. Um, I can guarantee you that. So um, that that's kind of where it it sparked, and uh, from then it just became its own beast. Uh, as I got. A little bit older, my grandfather gave me one of his like mini tape recorders uh, with a little mini tape cassette. It was about like this size. 
um, and it, you know, a couple AAA batteries, and I would record over those tapes over and over again, um, and would just go go nuts with that, like creating my own little radio shows, my own little commercial spots, um, play by play of random things, like you know, just inane, mundane things going on around the house uh, constantly, and that um, that kind of that that stayed with me. Um, my grandfather was kind of out of the spotlight as I was getting older and as he was getting older. So I didn't really get to see him in action. I saw him do some public speaking gigs, um, but most of it was, you know, old video and stuff like that. So um, I didn't, you know, it, it really wasn't, uh, it, it, he kind of laid down the foundation for me and I kind of built upon it from there. Um, but I learned more about him uh, actually after he passed away and his style of broadcasting and the way he, you know, went about um, everything he did uh, much more posthumously and uh, with the advent of YouTube and the like and, you know, his books. Uh, and then from hearsay and people in the industry who worked with him. So, um, so that impact is there and uh, it'd be, it, it was stronger on me, um, uh, you know, posthumously, but uh, the foundation was, was laid down when I was five years old. That's great. You do an absolutely fantastic impression of him. You've done it, you know, publicly before. Tell me a little bit about, you know, how you, how you were able to, you know, get such a good impression of him. I mean, you grow up with that voice, um, yeah. you know, and I've always been really, really adept at uh, uh, imitating things and, and, um, and doing pretty spot on imitations um, uh, with limitations, of course, and I, I know what they are, but I can pretty much imitate uh, anything. And it's just this thing where it plays my mind and I'm able to manipulate my voice. Uh, so being able to imitate someone who was around um, for, you know, the first 15, 16 years of my life, uh, it was, was, was pretty easy. And um, also it became almost a competitive thing. I'm a, a very competitive person. Um, so many people are doing imitations of my grandfather and doing the imitations for me and to me and at me, um, sometimes unwarranted or, uh, um, you know, out of just like, like, Hey, I'm just going to attack you with my, your grandfather's imitation. I'm like, Whoa, I didn't need that. Um, so it was more of like, you know, I, I can do it far better than you. So I'm just going to stop you while you're ahead. That's great. So, you know, tell me a little bit about, you said that, you know, as you got older, you know, you didn't really get to see him in action as much, but what has been, you know, the greatest time you did get to see him in action, you know, whether it was on TV when you were a little kid. Um, I remember one time I went with him to the uh, 92nd Street Y in uh, in in the city on uh, I think it's Lexington and, and 86th and um, or no 90, 92nd why would I say 86th um, it was Lexington and 92nd that's that makes a lot more sense um, and uh, it's sorry it's that COVID brain it's gotten to me <laughs> um, and uh, and I went to the speaking engagement with him and. It was really funny. I was sitting with my grandmother in the crowd and um, had no idea what he was talking about. I mean, I was like eight, nine years old and um, I was kind of like getting antsy. And so I got up to go use the bathroom. Didn't really need to go. I just wanted to get up and like stretch my legs and, and find something to entertain me for a couple of minutes. Well, my grandfather saw that I'd gotten up because I was a bright blonde haired uh, little boy. And saw me and literally stopped in the middle of whatever he was saying and he's like son where are you going son come on up here come on up here we'll get a chair for you come sit with papa and i'm like i okay and at that point i already knew i loved audiences so i'm like all right i'll get on stage with you in this room full of people like that's kind of cool but it was also frightening um and so i went there and i i sat you know next to uh, him while he was at his lectern addressing this crowd of you know, several hundred people. And at one point, uh, my grandfather stopped to take a sip of water and I got up to just stretch for a second. This person stands up and says, uh, Howard, if you don't mind, uh, it's your grandson standing up, uh, would it be okay with you too if I were to just ask him a quick question? And my grandfather laughs and he goes, son, do you want it? And it's like, okay. And his question was, um, you know, what, what's it like to have Howard Cosell as your grandfather? And me, you know, being a little uh, you know, wisecracking kid. I was like, well, and you know, everyone starts laughing. I was like, no, I'm kidding. It's great. He's amazing. Blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and that was it. And he, you know, gave me a pat on the shoulder and I sat back down and uh, um, the adrenaline and, and sheer fright from that moment uh, pretty much kept me wide awake and alert for the remainder of that. And, um, you know, it was, it was funny walking out with my grandfather and people 
you know, coming up to him and thanking him for speaking, um, you know, that night and, uh, and telling me I did a great job. And I'm like, I was asked one question, but I, I just, I loved that moment as well. So that was, uh, that was, that was pretty unique and fun for me since I never actually got to be in the broadcast booth with him. That sounds like, yeah, it sounds like a really fun moment. So you talked about how you have the ability, you know, imitate people very well, whether it's your grandfather or, you know, anyone else. Has that, you know, definitely played into, you know, your comedy career? Um, yeah, yeah, at times, you know, um, you know, I, I experimented with sometimes, um, you know, I was at the height of uh, Family Guy phenomenon, I would do my spot on Stewie imitation and, um, and, and then there were times where I would, you know, do crowd work and I would just mimic the person, you know, what they just said. If what they said to me sounded moronic, I would just speak to them in their own voice in the way I heard it. Um, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't make that a, uh, a point of my, my comedy career. I didn't want to just be, uh, you know, a one trick pony, you know, um, mimic comic. Um, so for me, it was and a lot of my comedy, my, I'd say a good, 12 of the, the 17 years that I did stand up where I, I was an MC uh, or the host of the show. So um, I stopped really kind of writing jokes. Like I'd come up with things that were topical, but typically it was crowd work um, because A, it was a lazy approach, but B, I'm just there to warm up the crowd. And what better way to do that than to interact with them and try to come up with jokes on the spot. So it was kind of a lazy approach, but also a like fly by the seat of your pants um, approach because you have to be kind of confident in your confident in your ability to, um, you know, take whatever they're saying and make it funny right then and there. And um, so that that was that was more my approach to to comedy. That's that's great. So, what experience did you get there? I mean, you know, you're now the currently the PA announcer for the Mets. You know, did you feel like you learned you know your ability to speak to you know large people in that way from that job? Um, I learned the the comfort of being in front of a, a large crowd by doing theater. Um, you know, you, um, cause I, I had, um, several leading or, or co-starring roles, um, throughout high school. I was in a, um, small, uh, school, small private school in high school. So, um, there really wasn't much competition. I'm not trying to say I was that great. Um, and you know, when, when the spotlight's on you and, you know, you're singing a song or delivering a monologue or something like that, you know, they're, um, you, you have to be confident in what you're doing or the, the crowd will read that. And that you parlay that into stand-up comedy and uh, it's the same thing, except now it's your own words. And, uh, and they are there specifically to, um, in theater, you're there to feel like a wide range of emotions. In stand-up comedy, you're there to laugh and you are there to laugh alone. And if you are coming up short on that, they will eat you alive and there will be hecklers uh, and, I think even worse than hecklers, there will be dead silence. And to have a silent room is, I mean, time goes like tick, tick. Like it is painful. Um, so, you know, it, it, that, it, um, that, that kind of played, you know, into building up your confidence and your ability to be confident in what you're doing. Um, but I also knew that, there was this weird thing in me that like talking one-on-one -on -one to someone is far less comfortable to me than speaking to, um, you know, a ballpark filled with 47,000 people. Um, I can't explain it. Uh, like I understand why people get stage fright. Like I, I can kind of wrap my head around it, but at the end of the day, it, it really makes no sense to me. I'm like, how do you not love this? Um, so, you know, I, to kind of build, on that and um, cutting my teeth uh, in any crowd I could get. Like I'd come back from college and uh, do the PA for my high school homecoming football game um, and had a lot of fun with that. And uh, in my mid thirties, I got my first, I guess, professional PA gig um, for the New York Empire, which is in the AUDL, Ultimate Frisbee, um, Ultimate Disc League, um, the American Ultimate Disc League. Uh, and you know, that was, that was kind of fun for me because I was also playing the music and doing the, the PA um, for a professional team. Granted, it's a fringe sport. Um, and, you know, the crowds weren't really that big. So there was wiggle room for if I screwed up um, and for me to have some fun with it. And like if uh, one of our players scored addressing him by his nickname instead of his full name um, and, and, and things like that. Um, so when I got the, the meds gig, I was like, this is perfect for me because, uh, you know, why wouldn't I want to address a crowd of, you know, 45 to 47,000 people? Um, 
And now it's like, well, there are football stadiums and arenas out there that hold 100,000 people. So I'm like, well, how do I get into that? So uh, now it's kind of like no crowd could be too big. Um, you know, the, the bigger, the better. And because for as a PA announcer, you feed off of the energy of the crowd. Um, so if I'm announcing Jacob deGrom, I know when I finish saying his name, the crowd is going to go nuts. And in that moment, we have this synergy uh, between us. We're, we're all really excited. You know, my blood's pumping, their blood's pumping. And it's just like that is pure heaven to me. That's great. So that's a good part of your job. You know, what's, what's something else you love about your job? Um, being paid to watch sports. <laughs> like I am, I'm paid to watch baseball. Like I, I don't, I don't have to pay to go to a ballpark anymore. Like um, that, that to me is, is mind boggling. Um, I, but I'll tell you that the one thing I love the most and it will never get old is pulling into the, uh, the parking lot at City Field or, at uh, Nassau Coliseum for the Riptide um, and doing so as a member of the staff and um, looking at that place and being like, my voice fills up that arena or that ballpark uh, and, and it is going to um, shortly. And um, walking into the ballpark and nobody knows me, I'm just, I'm just a voice, everyone's back is to me anyway. So, um, uh, but walking into the ballpark and then like hearing my voice bellowing from the external PA telling people what they can and can't bring into the ballpark and these are the rules and this that and the other thing and it's just it's kind of it's just kind of cool it's like you know I, I'm I'm walking in as an anonymous nobody and yet um unbeknownst to all these people like that's my voice telling them what they can and cannot do and it's it's just kind of cool for me like when you use a microphone and you are a public speaker for a living um to hear your voice come back at you it, it, and in a professional setting especially in one of the, the four major sports in the United States is, is mind blowing and it will never get old. And so you've used your voice for good since the quarantine has started. You've offered your services of, you know, walk up, you know, talking for anyone, you know, a personalized message. Tell me a bit about the initiative. Um, yeah, I originally started it. Um, I just, in December of 2018, after I finished my first season with the Mets, um, you know, they had had a PA announcer named Alex Anthony, who, uh, who's actually a friend of mine. And um, he'd been there for 15, 16, 17 years. And so fans were very, very used to that voice. I mean, that, that long. Um, and they had grown very accustomed to him. And um, so obviously there were some growing pains bringing in, you know, new voices into City Field. So I just thought a good way to connect with the fans um, because I am kind of a people person. I'm a big ham and I, I don't want to just be a voice. Like I, I want there to be a face or at least some sort of interaction with them. Um, in December of, the, of 2018, I decided I would use the hashtag call me up Colin, tell them, uh, give me your, your name or the person who you want this for, uh, their jersey number, the position they play in their walk-up song, and I'll give them an announcement uh, in the same fashion I do in the ballpark. And I said the first 10 to do it, I would record it for them. They could use it as a Christmas gift, a Hanukkah gift, or just keep it for themselves or whatever. And I got like 90 submissions and I saw that there were some disappointments some disappointed tweets like, oh man, I missed it or I didn't get picked. And I felt really bad. And I'm like, well, the whole point of this wasn't just to make it a contest. It was to connect with the fans. So um, I waited a little bit of time after Christmas and I recorded the rest of them and, and sent them all out there. Um, and, um, and it was a lot of fun. Fast forward to the pandemic, the very first day that we had uh, the stay-at-home orders in New York, um, my wife, fortunately, was able to work from home. Uh, so while she was, you know, pivoting her business into a virtual uh, world, um, I was like, well, what, what can I do here? And I was like, oh, resurrect, call me up, call and see what happens. You know, and about 150 people um, reached out, and uh, so I recorded it for them, and then some press started picking it up and then more press started picking it up. And then um, within a month, you know, it was, I was getting, you know, interview requests um, quite a bit. And then the Associated Press re re released a, uh, an article about it on Monday, April 20th. And then it just like really blew up. And I was getting, you know, NBC Universal over in the UK was asking me for interviews, like all these different things popped up. That week was insane. Um, and at that point there had been, about six, 600 um, call-ups um, within a week and a half, two weeks, uh, you know, and I'm still trying to get caught up on it. Uh, there will have been about 1,200 recorded. Oh, so you're still doing it right now? Yeah. <clears throat> There's, um, I'm a one-man production army, 
And so I'm literally sorting through them because um, I, I also made a preference for um, anyone who's, everyone who's on the front line. So if there are EMT, police, firefighters, uh, teachers, and, and smaller children who had you know, their lives turned upside down as well, but um, frontline workers and children were, were getting preference um, over the other ones. So trying to sort through those and make sure I get to them first um, made it a very daunting task. And so, yeah, I'm still getting caught up and um, it's, it's tough, you know, uh, it's tough to do that on top of, uh, I've got a bunch of other things going on as well. And I can't, I can't just dedicate, you know, 12 to 14 hours a day solely to call me up Colin as much as I'd love to. So yeah, it's, it's been, it's been, uh, it's been tough and I'm still, yeah, I'm still sorting through them. Um, you know, I ended it on May 6th and uh, I think I'm now up to about orders that came in through uh, April 28th. So I think I've got about a week's worth of uh, the remaining orders to sift through and, and get out there. But everyone has been really patient, except for a couple, but whatever. <laughs> um, they, they actually, they got, they got shamed by other people. They're like, dude, like, stop. Like someone actually re 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 uh, replied to one of them uh, with just a face palm emoji. So, um, and I'm like, you know what? It's all good. I understand. Like you're on my list. Know that I will get to you. Um, and if it ends up being by Christmas of 2023, still, I'll get to it. I promise that. But, um, hopefully by, um, the end of, uh, you know, the first week of June, I will have gotten through all of them and gotten them all out there. That's awesome. That's a great thing to do. Tell me a little bit about your time with, you know, MSG varsity, you know, or sports broadcast, sports broadcaster there, you know, what was your best moment there? Um, winning three Emmys. <laughs> that was definitely a highlight. No, professionally it was. Um, a gentleman named Marty Ehrlich took a chance on me when I told him uh, that I wanted to get into sports broadcasting finally, where I felt like, um, you know, there was enough separation from my grandfather, myself, and myself as a personality and the way I would convey that as a sports broadcaster that would differentiate myself from him. My grandfather's a lawyer. I was a stand-up comic and a, and a theater actor. Like, you know, you, you can't have more different backgrounds than that. Um, and so Marty took a chance on me with this brand new network covering high school sports in the tri-state area, New, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, and, um, and gave me my first shot as a sideline reporter for this marquee matchup uh, of high school basketball. From there, he gave me more and more work. Um, my number one sport, the one that I played and the sport that I love the most is hockey. So he gave me a lot of um, uh, color commentary with, with hockey and then more sports and um, just kept giving me more and more things to do, um, including some production, some writing. Uh, I narrated three series, which is how we won uh, those, those Emmys. Um, and then a fourth series, um, I actually helped produce and write and narrated. Uh, we got some Emmy nominations, didn't win, but, you know, it's just an honor to be nominated. Um, and, uh, and then, um, you know, I, he allowed me to be an anchor for their thing called High School Sports Desk, which was their equivalent of Sports Center. Um, he really let me cut my teeth and broaden my horizons and um, and fine tune my talents and my abilities in and made me a, a Swiss army knife uh, when it came to broadcasting. Um, so, you know, in, in the short five years I was there, I learned a ton and Marty and I are still friends. We're still in contact. We're um, we're actually trying to work together right now on a project. So um, you know, it was, it was really exciting. The whole, the whole process was, was amazing, but, uh, having to buy a tuxedo and go to the Emmy Awards and, and learning that we won and went up on stage was just like mind blowing because it was the last thing I ever expected to come from, uh, anything I was doing with them. Tell me a little bit more about that experience of winning an Emmy. Um, it, you know, it was, it was unfortunate because the very first category we were nominated, nominated for, we won. And so that gives you this false impression that like, it's just that easy, you know, <laughs> like it just means that the other nine nominations categories we're up for, obviously we're going to win. <coughs> Excuse me. So, and obviously that is not the case. Um, and then we won our next category as well. So I'm like, Oh my God, this is, this is easy. And then like the next four straight categories we did not. And I was like, Oh, all right, this is, you know, it takes you right back down to earth. Um, but it was, it was awesome. I mean, it, it's, it's one of those things that you never imagined in a million years. And I think the one thing that stood out to me the most wasn't like holding the trophy. It was looking out in a room filled with people that I've watched on TV um, my entire life, um, looking at me now 
um, winning an, an Emmy award. And it was like, I mean, I, I still to this day don't feel like I'm worthy of it. Like I don't, um, it's not one of those things I'll bring up and it, it looks like it's like a humble brag. Like if someone comes over to the house and they see one, they're like, you have Emmys? And like, oh, those old things? Yeah, they're just they, like, you know, what? I'm not going to be like, hey, everybody look at my Emmys. Uh, I'm so cool because they're, they're great and everything. And I, no one can ever take that away from me. Um, and, you know, it, and it's cool because my grandfather won six and I'm, I'm half, halfway there. Um, but they don't do anything outside of uh, look shiny and pretty. They don't, people aren't going to look at your resume and say, I want to hire that guy because he won an award one time. You know, they want to know that they're good for, for that specific job. Um, so it's not, not to diminish them at all. Um, but that's just, that's just something that, you know, I have with me and was, you know, a, a really cool um, thing that happened. But, um, you know, I can equate that with being able to uh, be, you know, when I first did play-by-play -play for hockey for the New Jersey High School Championships and the two top teams, Del Barton and Don Bosco Prep were playing against each other. And the fact that I was calling that game because that, that's basically like a JV to D1 hockey. Like these kids are, they're on, most of them are going to D1. Um, so being able to call like that caliber of, of a game to me was, was just as cool because for me, that was something I'd wanted my entire life as a broadcaster. And at no point did I sit there and say at age five, I want to talk into a microphone and hopefully get a trophy for it. That's great. So nine Emmys in the family, that's a, that's a pretty cool thing to have. So uh, it's actually it's 11 my brother has a couple as well oh yeah well, <laughs> he was oh, he was a producer and i'm sorry you got no one's ever brought it up before so i've never had the chance to do it but he was a producer for uh for sports center uh for a few years so he won a couple of emmys first he uh be, be long before i did so um so yeah there's uh, they're <laughs> all told yeah there there are 11 emmys in the family <laughs> now i sound like a real schmuck <laughs> that honestly doesn't surprise me i mean there's there's so much talent in your family you know came from your grandfather tell me a little bit about you know your advice for kids who want to get into the sports industry and you know maybe win an emmy themselves um the the number one thing i tell uh, i tell uh, anyone who wants to get in this industry is to a be a good person be nice um you know don't take yourself too seriously um always look out for it, take care of and befriend your crew um everyone that's in the production truck uh, your director, all the way down to, you know, your graphics guy, replay, um, uh, your cameraman. Um, these are the people that make you look and sound good. Um, they're the ones that will recommend you if a job comes up. And uh, at the end of the day, they tend to be really funny, cool, quirky, artsy, neat people anyway. Like, they're the type of people you want to hang out with. Uh, not to say I don't want to hang out with some of my fellow broadcasters, but more often than not, I, you know, I'd rather hang out with, with our crew. I was the same way with, uh, with theater, like the stage crew, stage manager. They were always the people I wanted to be uh, closest with. Um, number two, be versatile. Um, don't just relegate yourself to being, well, I want to be the lead play-by-play -play guy on Monday Night Football. Well, guess what? That job goes to one person in the world, and it's usually for years at a time, and it's usually someone that's been around the block for a long time. Not to say you can't get that job, but don't, you know, don't, don't relegate yourself to that one specific goal. Um, also learn different crafts, you know, be great, be really great at one to maybe two things, but be really good at some other things as well. Being able to edit, um, you know, using Avid or um, using uh, Adobe Audition for, for audio, learn how to, um, you know, key in uh, graphics on a green screen, learn how to light, uh, learn how lighting works. Uh, learn how sound works, like learn all of these crafts, learn how a camera works. You know, these are all things that will come in handy should a pandemic strike and you're not broadcasting anymore, but, you know, the New York Mets are still putting together, um, you know, uh, these video pieces that they're going to put on social media and on, on SNY on our, on our network. Um, that, that's work. Someone is still doing that. Uh, and it could be someone who has now I'm not saying I have that versatility I do have these skills and all but we have an unbelievably proficient uh, not even proficient I mean highly skilled staff but I'm just saying uh in along the way those are those are skill sets that are going to open more doors for you and I kind of assimilated to having um four faucets running at the same speed at the same time 
and you've got four buckets and you want to keep two of the buckets as empty as possible. Um, and that is your, you're trying to achieve greatness. Uh, you can, you've got all four filling up. You can get those two empty and then try to tend to the next two. But if you're trying, your goal is to keep those empty. If that is your perfection, you're going to pay attention to those other two and you'll get to those, you know, whenever you can um, and, and, and keep them as empty as you can. That's the same sort of thing. Like it's okay to wear many different hats in this industry, but you can only really truly be great at one to two things. Uh, but you can be proficient and good enough uh, and hireable at, at other things as well. That's great. So that's your advice for getting to the sports industry in general. What's your advice specifically for being a PA announcer? Uh, that is, um, you know, with PA announcing, it is such a, a niche job. Um, it is um, start young, take every opportunity you can, um, get to know PA announcers uh, on, a, on, a, on a minor league level um, and, and reach out to uh, major league uh, PAs as well, especially younger ones. The older ones, they want to kind of keep to themselves. They've been doing this for years. And um, not to say that some of them won't uh, be open to talking to you, but um, talk to them. Ask if, they, if you can shadow them and develop relationships there and you know plant those seeds um that you know you're interested in getting into this someday um you know it a lot of this industry is uh who you know not what you know it is a lot of networking and if you can plant seeds and get on someone's radar and the next time they see you they recognize you or the next time they get an email from you they're going to be inclined to respond to you instead of being like i'll get to it later that's going to be imperative to your success and your growth um, because a lot of PA announcers stay in their jobs for a long time. So if any of, uh, of the, the kids out there are watching this are gunning for my job, you're going to have to, you're going to have to kill me first because um, I want to stay in this booth until I can no longer speak. Um, but you know, that's, there, are, there are people that for some of them, it's a stepping stone for some of them, you know, other jobs arise and they'll need a backup PA announcer. Um, and I have met a lot of people, um, the, uh, Kevin Casey, who is uh, the Philadelphia union, uh, major league soccer PA announcer, his, his voice is golden. It is gorgeous. And he has gotten a lot of PA jobs, um, as a result of that outside of just the union, he started by asking if he could be the page turner for, uh, the, his predecessor, um, and for the guy who was doing it for the Eagles. Uh, and the guy was like, sure. You know, and that's his in. He sits there, he'll turn the pages of his scripts, not get paid a thing, but sit there and watch and learn. And when something would come up, he'd be like, hey, Kevin, you know, there's an opening here. I can put you in touch with the right guy. Um, and that, that literally, that's, that's, that's how you do it. Um, hone your craft, start getting every PA gig you can in high school, uh, in your college. Um, and you know, listen to other PA announcers, see what you like about what they do, what you don't like about what they do, find your voice in the process and, and network, 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 network. That's great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your advice. I really enjoyed, you know, learning about your career. Thank you so much. And hold.